When the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863, the black community owned less than 1% of the United States' total wealth. More than 150 years later, that number has barely budged. The color of money probes the persistence of this racial wealth gap by focusing on the generations of wealth in the black community, black banks. Studying these institutions over time, Mersa Baradarin challenges the idea that black communities could ever accumulate wealth in a segregated economy. In this excerpt, she examines banking in a segregated economy and the political and economic hurdles faced by black-owned banks in the early 21st century. The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap by Marissa Baradarin. There are two banking systems in America. One is the regulated and heavily subsidized mainstream banking industry. The other is the unregulated, costly, and often predatory fringe industry. The black community has historically been under the latter system, having been left out of the former. This has come at great expense to that community. Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein found that blacks pay on average of $425 more for loans than white customers. Most black neighborhoods are banking deserts, neighborhoods abandoned by mainstream banks. The FDIC's surveys on the unbanked and underbanked reveal that 60% of blacks are either unbanked or underbanked. In striking contrast, only 3% of whites do not have a bank account and 15% are underbanked. Those without bank accounts pay up to 10% of their income, or around $2,400 per year, just to use their money. That is a meaningful amount of money for low-income Americans, and it is being sucked up by alternative financial services. This problem has been exacerbated since the crisis of 2008 when 93% of all bank closings occurred in low-income neighborhoods. When banks leave a neighborhood, the sharks usually fill the void. Banking deserts are left vulnerable to high-cost payday lenders, title lenders, and other fringe banks. Once the subprime profits dried up as a result of the crisis, banks began avoiding the ghetto again. By 2016, an investigation of mortgage lending in St. Louis found that banks made fewer loans to borrowers in black neighborhoods than white ones. Mortgage applicants from minority zip codes were denied at significantly higher rates than applicants in white neighborhoods. Unsurprisingly, it appears that contract selling has actually made a comeback in these areas abandoned by banks. This time, private equity firms are leading the charge. Buyers are given loans that look like mortgages but they are in fact more like rental agreements, under which the borrower can be evicted because of a missed payment. In one example, a private equity investor bought a foreclosed home for $8,000 and sold it on contract for $36,000. In banking deserts, blacks rely disproportionately on payday lenders. They are more than twice as likely as any other race to use payday loans. With such costly credit options, it is no wonder that debt collectors extract as much as five times more judgments against black neighborhoods than white ones. Two studies conducted between 2015 and 2016 revealed that blacks were much more likely to be sued by debt collectors than any other racial group, even when differences in income were accounted for. One in four black residents in the studied communities was being sued by a debt collector. Most of these lawsuits were similar, large debt collectors suing for small amounts. The study found that debt collectors were not intentionally discriminating, but that white consumers are, in general, better able to resolve smaller debts. Indeed, the study confirmed that black communities simply have less wealth than white ones and therefore enjoy less of a buffer against hardship. Unsurprisingly, Black college graduates owe an average of 53000 more than their white counterparts in student debt. 
Blacks have to borrow more for college and have to carry greater debt several years after graduation, usually from two to three times the amount of white graduates. Black students default on student debt at a rate five times higher than white or Asian graduates, and because student loans cannot be discharged in bankruptcy, this debt is carried until it is paid off. The racial wealth gap not only means that black families have greater difficulty ascending the economic ladder, it also means that it is much easier for these families to fall. Because wealth provides a cushion against life's hard edges, those without it are exposed to devastating financial shocks like bankruptcy, eviction, and apparently lots of lawsuits. These lawsuits further ratchet up the financial pressure through wage garnishments, aggressive collection practices, and criminal prosecutions. These actions create what one black resident in the study called a web of indebtedness. A wage garnishment can feel like extortion, but increasingly, creditors are using actual extortion. Often, the original credit, such as a municipality, sells its debts to an underworld of unregulated debt collectors who threaten debtors with criminal prosecution in order to intimidate them into paying their debts. These threats are usually baseless and illegal, but that does not stop these unscrupulous bounty hunters from continually harassing debtors. In 2015, a cell phone video showed a police officer shooting an unarmed man, Walter Scott, who was running away from the officer. The press coverage focused on the fact that the officer had allegedly lied about the shooting and appeared on video to be planting a weapon near Scott's body. Less attention was paid to the reason Scott was running away from the officer in the first place. It was revealed that he was likely running because he had unpaid debt and may have been worried about criminal retribution. The wealth disparity leads cryptically and tragically to many seemingly unrelated injustices suffered by the black community. The destructive economic and social forces created within the boundaries of a racially segregated ghetto are interrelated. The effects of the most recent loss of black wealth were not just in lost homes and bank accounts, but in the resulting loss of social and community capital. From 2003 to 2013, Detroit closed 150 public schools and Chicago closed 50 in 2013 alone primarily in black and brown neighborhoods. Black unemployment reached a 20-year high, and black and brown prisoners make up almost 60% of the prison population. Many black communities are opportunity deserts, lacking in paths toward upward mobility, yet with an overabundance of pitfalls that result in incarceration or worse. Languishing in what Chimamanda Gnosiadichi has called the oppressive lethargy of choicelessness. Many are born into and live their whole lives with the certainty that they will not be able to escape their circumstances. The National Urban League reported in 2015 that the state of black America was one of crisis. The report followed up in words reminiscent of the Kerner Commission, America Today is a Tale of Two Nations. The Obama administration did make inroads into poverty alleviation, specifically the Affordable Care Act was aimed at lowering health care costs, which are a major source of financial distress for the low income. President Obama, like his predecessors, did not specifically target the racial wealth gap, nor did he advocate a race-based economic agenda. The administration's efforts were a continuation of theories underlying black capitalism, and the updated community capitalism of the Clinton administration. In several speeches, Obama heralded the importance of small businesses and minority businesses, including renewing Minority Business Enterprise Week, and praising the importance of minority businesses in several small forums. On the campaign trail, he had promised to help bring business back to our inner cities, he envisioned creating institutions akin to the World Bank to spur economic development. He lamented that less than 1% of the $250 billion in venture capital that's invested each year goes to minority businesses 
that are trying to breathe the life into our cities. This has to change. He promised that he would make sure every community had financial institutions that can help get them started on the road to building wealth. These promises were not pursued, either because of the game-changing financial crisis, the antagonistic legislative environment, or perhaps due to the president's lack of conviction on black capitalism. When Obama was asked in 2012 to respond to criticism that his administration had not done enough to support black business, the premise being that helping black business was akin to addressing black poverty, he responded, I'm not the president of black America, I'm the president of the United States of America. The Treasury did announce in 2015 that it would name its newly created wing after the Freedmen's Bank. This would be the first time, of course, that the Treasury would actually be linked to the bank. The last time the link was purely speculative and the depositors paid the price. The Treasury also decided to put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. Banking agencies are still carrying out their FIRREA legislative mandate to support minority banks. The Minority Bank Deposit Program, MBDP, is still ongoing, which means that federal agencies and federal grant recipients are encouraged to deposit funds into banks owned or controlled by women or minorities. Typical deposit funds are agency deposits of public money, cash advances to federal contractors and grantees, postal service funds, and other monies held by the agencies. The FDIC also runs its own minority bank deposit program called the Minority Depository Institution Program, MDIP. The MBDA, the successor to the OMBE, is still active and advertises on its website that it is the only federal agency created specifically to foster the establishment and growth of minority-owned business in America. Its most advertised feature is a website for minority entrepreneurs called the Minority Business Internet Portal, which is described as an e-commerce solution designed for the MBE, Minority Business Enterprise, community. In 2007, the House Committee on Financial Services held a hearing to assess whether regulatory agencies were meeting the FIRREA mandate of preserving and expanding minority banks. Black bank representatives and top agency officials testified about the state of minority banks with a focus on Black-owned banks. The hearing was accompanied by an expansive GAO report. The FDIC testified that it was offering technical assistance and training and educational programs to minority banks. As for the charge to preserve and promote minority banks, the agency explained that it did not have a process in place to do this, but made decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. The Office of the Comptroller explained that it had held conferences, offered technical assistance, and then after periodic bank examinations, the examiners contacted minority institutions to make sure that the institution understands any issues or concerns that we have highlighted in the report and we can help them. The Office of Thrift Supervision, OTS, explained that its program consisted of technical assistance and education. Education, guidance, training, and counseling. That was the theme of the support being given to black banks. Apparently, it was not just minority subprime borrowers who needed education, but also minority banks. The regulators have essentially been playing the role of high school guidance counselor, available for advice or technical assistance with the occasional workshops for good measure. With Section 308's vague requirements and non-clear mandates from either the President or Congress, what else were they supposed to do but offer regulatory handholding? Unsurprisingly, the minority banks were not relying on their regulators for help. The GAO reported that only 30% of minority banks had used the technical assistance offered by regulators. Moreover, no agency had ever assessed whether its assistance 
was actually helping these banks. The GAO revealed that the agencies had not undertaken the more difficult and time-consuming but ultimately much more important task of truly understanding the unique challenges these institutions face, or of trying to tailor their regulations, supervision, and examinations to help black banks to survive and prosper. Less than one-third thought the regulators were doing a very good or good job. Robert Cooper, representing the National Bankers Association, the main trade group for black-owned banks, put it bluntly. To be honest, said Cooper, we have not seen much benefit from FIRREA Section 308. Regulators had not applied. Any different rules or approaches to minority institutions than major institutions. Regulators were doing the bare minimum required by law, which amounted to technical assistance, and had steadfastly refused to make use of their available power to benefit minority banks. The regulatory support was a facade, but then again, so was the premise underlying the entire framework. Even before the financial crisis virtually wiped out the industry, several government studies showed that black banks were lagging significantly behind their peers in profitability. According to Standard & Poor's data, the average median return on equity in 2016 was 8.04%, for the banking industry as a whole. For black-owned banks, the median was just 1.19%. The reasons black banks remained unprofitable had not changed after almost a century of operation. Cooper told Congress that the biggest struggles black banks faced were the economically depressed communities they operated in, their need to keep high reserves for losses, higher general expenses than other banks, and higher transaction costs because they dealt with a higher proportion of retail customers on a face-to-face -face basis. Black banks were still hamstrung by their reliance on small, high-activity deposits, and they made fewer and smaller loans than white banks, which reduced their profitability. They had lower non-interest-based income, 19.5% compared to 42.7%, for non-minority banks, because they sold fewer fee-based products to their less wealthy customers. The CEO of Liberty Bank, one of the largest and most successful black-owned banks, described his bank's struggle. My expenses are twice as much because I have to do more counseling to my borrower. I may have to have guard service because I am in a high-crime area. My deposits are much smaller. While regulators were offering education and training programs to help black banks, it was clear that the black banks knew exactly what their problems were, and it was not a lack of technical knowledge. However, just as it is unfair to place the burden of the black wealth gap on black banks, it is unfair to blame black regulators for not helping enough. The regulators' sole focus is to manage bank risks. They do not have the tools, mandate, or even the education to understand and fix the unique bind in which black banks find themselves. Perhaps recognizing this limitation, black bank advocates did not ask for more help from regulators during the congressional hearing. What they wanted was meaningful regulatory and legislative action. Specifically, NBA President Cooper asked that banking regulators consider how their broad policies might affect minority banks and consider changing them so as not to unduly burden the banks. For example, recent regulatory changes had added another obstacle for black banks in raising capital. Most banks in need of capital can issue common stock, but minority banks cannot sell shares in their banks in this way because it threatens their minority status. In order to maintain minority ownership, they issue preferred stock. However, Banking capital rules, specifically the Basel I guidelines put into effect in 2004, discounted preferred stock and favored common stock, which gave black banks a weaker capital profile than majority banks. Kim Saunders, president of Mechanics and Farmers, explained, 
that black banks are at a significant disadvantage regardless of our stature of profitability in our abilities to raise capital. Saunders proposed that the existing CDFI fund, which offered tax breaks to banks in underserved communities, reserve some of those benefits for minority banks. According to Representative Maxine Waters, out of $16 billion in tax credits available through the New Markets Tax Credit Program, only one black bank had received a grant. Instead, large banks such as Capital One, Wachovia, Bank of America, and others had received tax credits for development projects in the inner city. According to Saunders, mainstream banks had recently and suddenly found those unserved or underserved markets to be a worthwhile place for a bank branch. But according to Saunders, they were not there for the benefit of the community. Black bankers had always seen their mission as being larger than profitability. If the economic milieu in which black banks found themselves had not changed significantly in the preceding century, neither had their non-economic appeal. NBA President Robert Cooper explained that these institutions aren't just providers of financial products and services, they truly are beacons of hope for the community. Maxine Waters admitted during the 2007 congressional hearings that she had investments in several of the black banks being discussed. In the black community, according to Waters, the test of your commitment to economic expansion and development and support for business is whether or not you put your money where your mouth is. You will find that most black professionals belong to, participate with, their minority banks in their community. It is expected of us. We should do it. And it is a true test of our commitment. Before the legislators could resolve any of the issues presented at the hearing, the 2008 financial crisis rocked the country, especially the established banking regulatory framework. Congress responded with the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act. Dodd-Frank did contain specific provisions dealing with minority banks, but they were far from robust. The act ignored most of the recommendations that came up during the hearings. The only change to the regulatory framework consisted of Section 367-4A of the Act, which amended FIRREA Section 308 to apply to all the banking agencies instead of just the OTS and the FDIC, which was due in part to the Act's termination of the OTS altogether. Section 342 of Dodd-Frank also required each banking agency to establish an Office of Minority and Women Inclusion, OMWI, which is required to increase the diversity of agency staff and to offer assistance to minority and women-controlled banks. Now all the agencies offer technical assistance, but still no tax breaks, no help with capital, and no structural reforms. Yet regulators continue to celebrate black banks relying on myths that bear little resemblance to actual history. Comptroller of the currency Tim Curry said at the National Bankers Association meeting in 2013, as in the early years after the Civil War, when the Freedmen's Bank provided a secure place for savings and a source of credit to encourage economic growth, minority institutions today can be a catalyst to ensure the vitality of low-income communities. In fact, the Freedmen's Bank was not a secure place for savings, and it provided no credit. Likewise, minority institutions have been unable to catalyze vitality. The black banking industry has ebbed and flowed since the 1860s, with several peaks in the 1920s, 1960s, and 1980s that correlated with peaks in the economy racial unrest, and sometimes increased segregation. By 2016, the industry was in a decade-long decline. Mechanics and Farmers of Durham, North Carolina announced in June 2015 that it was revamping its business model to become a community bank and not a black-owned bank. The bank changed its name to M&F, and CEO James Sills explained that the bank will be trying to reach new customers to attract younger customers and diversify their customer base. This is a historic shift for the largest, oldest, and strongest of the black-owned banks, one of a handful that have withstood the depression 
and every other recession since 1907. In the last decade, the black-owned banking industry has shrunk by more than half, from 51 banks in 2000 to 20 today. The struggles of the largest black-owned banks reveal some of the ongoing tensions in this sector. The poster child of community capitalism, Shore Bank, failed in 2010. The bank's failure was not due to anything remarkable or unusual. The bank failed because inner-city Chicago was financially devastated after the 2008 financial crisis. The bank had not made subprime loans, but it was still affected by the widespread fallout. Some criticized the bank's overzealousness and wondered whether the bank failed because it was too much into the social welfare thing. Although the failure was unremarkable, what happened afterwards was. Shore Bank's application for $70 million in TARP bailout funds created a media firestorm and a rage disproportionate not only to the funds requested, but completely disconnected from the scale of the total bank bailout. The unprecedented scrutiny and attention over Shore Bank's failure matched the hubbub over its founding. The press couldn't resist reporting on the demise of Clinton and Obama's favorite bank and calling out political favoritism. Representative Judy Biggert demanded information from the White House suggesting that the government was rescuing a politically connected bank while letting hundreds of others fail. President Obama had no connection to the bank except that they were both in Chicago at the same time. Even though the president played no role in allocating TARP funds, conservative conspiracy theories abounded about special treatment. Glenn Beck used his famous chalkboard to weave a ludicrous conspiracy theory that connected Shore Bank to all of his favorite enemies, including President Obama, Acorn, Bill Ayers, and Hillary Clinton. The bank did not receive a bailout and failed, causing losses to inner-city Chicago residents and bank investors. After the failure, the bank's assets were taken over by Urban Partnership Bank, which was a consortium of top Wall Street banks and investors, including Goldman Sachs, American Express, Citigroup, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, GE Capital, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. All of these politically connected banks had received not millions, but billions in TARP bailout funds. The bank is now a certified CDFI, and all of the investor banks received CRA credit for their investment. Harlem's bank also failed, but with a slightly different result. After its main competitor, Freedom National Bank, failed in 1990, Carver remained as the only black-owned bank in New York and one of the largest in the country. As is often the case, Harlem was hit especially hard during the financial crisis, and Carver suffered more than $60 million in loan losses. The bank held very few subprime loans, only 2% of its portfolio, but the domino effect of the financial crisis could not be avoided. For a bank that had seen only $20 million in total earnings since it went public in 1994, the loss was substantial. On the brink of collapse, the bank had to turn to the behemoths downtown for salvation. Carver received help from Treasury and a $55 million cash injection from the consortium of Wall Street banks, including Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Prudential Financial, and Citigroup. After the bailout, the U.S. Treasury owned 25% of the bank with the Wall Street Consortium controlling another 73%. Thus, the original shareholders were left with just 2% of the shares of their bank. The purchase helped Goldman secure an outstanding CRA rating after its purchase. The purchase saved the bank but wiped out its shareholders, many of whom were Harlem residents and longtime investors in the community institution. The bank is now listed as black-controlled instead of black-owned. The country's largest black-owned bank had ceased to be owned by blacks, but it's owned by the same few banks that own virtually every other bank in the country. In announcing the deal to shareholders, Carver CEO Deborah Wright announced, I understand the optics, but there was no alternative. The amount of capital we needed wasn't available locally. The optics are indeed bad, 
especially when one considers what happened when Citigroup and Goldman Sachs, key actors responsible for the financial crisis, were exposed to severe losses during the 2008 financial crisis. The government bailout restored 100% of their shareholder value. Their shareholders lost nothing. The same Wall Street banks that were enriched by pushing black families into subprime loans now owned one of the few remaining black banks that were working to serve rather than exploit the community. And the reason they now owned the bank was that they survived the crisis they helped create through a taxpayer bailout, while Carver did not. Goldman was saved because it was deemed too big, in reality too important, to fail. Carver was not. The formation of Carver from a struggling black bank to a Wall Street-owned bank mirrors exactly the transformation of the neighborhood it serves. Indeed, Harlem is experiencing something of a real estate renaissance, which looks more like a transformation. Instead of a smattering of small-scale businesses, Harlem now has large retail outlets, hotels, and businesses that have followed the wave of more prosperous residents. Many black residents are being priced out of Harlem as Manhattan's booming population begins to overflow uptown. Carver is also being priced out of the new Harlem. When the largest new residential property, a 28-story condominium, was built in Harlem, large banks downtown did all the financing. Carver sat out the monumental transformation of Harlem because it did not have enough capital to participate. The bank's current management remains committed to helping the black community with their distinctive business needs. In 2015, Carver's CEO, Michael Pugh, a Detroit native who worked as a bank teller in college and became a Capital One executive, outlined a plan for meeting Harlem's small business needs. Pugh proposed offering the community loans of $10,000 or less, which most banks consider too small to be worthwhile. Pugh explains, if a person who's running a kiosk on 125th Street came looking for a loan, another bank might offer him a credit card or nothing. We're going to provide something better. The bank is starting to turn a profit, but has a very small margin. Carver is being told to carry on with a commitment to the community. In a recent meeting at Carver's headquarters, the head of the U.S. Small Business Administration, Maria Contreras Sweet, praised the bank for its history of creating opportunities for the community. We need more like you, she told the Carver management. Thank you for being here. I know it hasn't been easy, Pew responded. No argument there.